We all know that mainstream American party politics is dominated by a duopoly. So much so that many of us are under the illusion that it could never be otherwise. We've grown up our entire lives under the assumption that America has two parties, Democrat and Republican, which between the two of them dominate almost every major elected office. If you want to get elected, you better pick one and toe the party line. As a result, we the voters tend to settle into our Democrat or Republican identities and cheer for either the blue team or the red team. If you're one of those that are caught up in the duopoly, it's time for a reality check. The fact is, our political party system has been something wildly different before, and it's about to go through a major transformation again. As entrenched as the American party system might seem, history teaches us that it has seen on average once in a generation reorganization as a result of demographic and ideological shifts reflecting new policy priorities. A major party shift is now ripe to erupt again and history is in the making. According to a recent NBC Wall Street Journal poll, 40% of respondents think the two-party system is broken and the country needs a third party, with only one in 10 saying our two-party system works well. And according to Gallup, independent is the fastest growing political affiliation in the country. It's becoming more and more obvious that the Democrat and Republican political parties are on a crash course with history and something is about to give. Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders each played a pivotal role in laying the foundations for what will come to be America's next great party system shift, changing the nature of the Republican and Democratic Party so much that there's nowhere left to go other than an outright reorganization of our political party system altogether. Shifting party systems are a part of American history. If you don't know that history, it might seem like we'd be stuck in our current duopoly forever. But if you do, you probably realize it's going to happen again. The United States began its first presidency without a political party. George Washington not only ran the nation for two terms unaffiliated with any party, but famously warned against them in his farewell address. He said, However, political parties may now and then answer popular ends. They are likely in the course of time and things to become potent engines by which cunning, ambitious, and unprincipled men will be enabled to subvert the power of the people and to usurp for themselves the reins of government, destroying afterwards the very engines which have lifted them to unjust dominion. John Adams wrote, not long after that, quote, there is nothing which I dread so much as a division of the Republic into two great parties, each arranged under its leader and concerting measures in opposition to each other. This, in my humble apprehension, is to be dreaded as the greatest political evil under our Constitution. And another founding father, Alexander Hamilton, wrote, quote, Nothing could be more ill-judged than that intolerant spirit which has, at all times, characterized political parties. So early warnings against political factions went unheeded, and following the only independent presidency in U.S. history with George Washington would begin an American tradition that has dominated to this day, which is the duopoly of two major political factions, just as John Adams feared. Every generation, however, the makeup of that duopoly has shifted with new parties emerging and old ones fading away or shifting, creating what has been dubbed new, quote, party systems. Understanding the trend of party systems will help us to understand what is happening right now. The first party system began with the election of 1796. The Federalists, headed by John Adams, were pro-big business and strong central government, and they were supportive of conservative England. They were against the French Revolution and supported by northern businessmen, bankers, and merchants. The Democrat Republicans, led by Thomas Jefferson, were supported by southern artisans and farmers. They were pro-states rights and they favored revolutionary France. The Federalists collapsed in 1815, sparking what would come to be known as the Era of Good Feelings, where for almost a decade, the Democrat-Republican Party was the only show in town, and there was a reduced emphasis on political party affiliation. President James Monroe even wanted to end political parties outright in the name of national unity. 
But then came the election of 1824, which ushered in the second party system. This election is one of the most contested in history and was so close it had to be decided by the House of Representatives. Factional tensions arose with the then-dominant Democratic-Republican Party, which ultimately led to the party bitterly fracturing. The winner, Andrew Jackson, started off as a Democrat-Republican, but then his presidency went on to launch the second party system. Out of the remnants of the old Democratic-Republican Party, he would go on to found the Democratic Party. Jackson made many political rivals, and his opponents would coalesce under the newly formed Whig Party, which was socially conservative and pro-business. The Democrat-Whig divide would mark the great political duopoly of the Second Party era. As the 1850s approached, new political questions were forming, especially around slavery. In 1860, the newly formed anti-slavery Republican Party burst onto the national scene with the election of Abraham Lincoln, ushering in the third party system. Every election from this point on would be between parties named Democrat and Republican. But over time, the party's composition, who supported them, and what they stood for changed enough that we think of those shifts as creating new party systems. After the Civil War, the parties were an odd mix. The former Confederates were Democrats, since Republicans were responsible for ending slavery. But as the Republicans shifted towards being an anti-immigrant party, Northern immigrants shifted towards the Democratic Party, beginning major demographic and cultural shifts. The fourth party system officially began with the election of 1896, but its seeds began in 1892 with the forming of the Populist Party in the southern and western parts of the U.S., which had a progressive anti-banker and plutocracy leaning. They won a few congressional elections, but eventually merged with the Democrats for the election of 1896. The progressive era and the fourth party system brought about a change in the composition of electoral politics. This era, which lasted into the early 1930s, was marked by attacks on political machines, regulations on big business, antitrust laws, women's suffrage, labor movements, worker rights, the establishment of the Public Bank of North Dakota, and credit unions, and other similar progressive policies. Following the rise of the People's Party, the Socialist Party was created in 1901, and then, in the election of 1912, former Republican President Theodore Roosevelt came roaring back to make an historical second bid for the presidency under his newly formed Progressive Party, which, under Roosevelt's brand of New Nationalism, would mark the only time in American history a third party would win second place in a national election. So the Great Depression shocked the country in 1929, and that ensured that by the upcoming election of 1932, the people would be clamoring for something different. The pattern of years of Republican domination was upended when Franklin Roosevelt, after barely scraping a win at the contested Democratic convention, defeated the Republican incumbent Herbert Hoover in a landslide, carrying 46 states in the general election on his radical New Deal platform, a new party system was born. Roosevelt's New Deal Democratic Party and its big government leftward lean would reverberate through the Voting Rights Act and Lyndon Johnson's Great Society Initiative. It is during this era that the New Deal Democrats brought in a wider coalition of progressives in the working class, Southern farmers who were drawn to New Deal farm policies and Catholic immigrants and African Americans who would now be shifting their support away from what was once the party of Lincoln. This New Deal coalition would more or less solidify the demographic makeup of the Democratic Party for generations. Unlike the previous five party systems, there's no clear electoral event to delineate the sixth, but it is widely interpreted to have begun in the 1960s when the South, a former Democrat stronghold, became firmly Republican and the party generally increased in strength into the slowly morphing cultural shifts. Whereas the parties were once mostly aligned based on class, today they are aligned more on social values. 
For example, white working class men who were once a demographic stronghold for progressive Democrats are now more likely to vote Republican along cultural lines, while many in the middle and upper classes are social liberals who vote Democrat. So where are we today? This equilibrium was upended by the 2016 election when Trump trounced the Republican Party establishment on his unconventional nationalist agenda, and Bernie Sanders, a progressive and New Deal-style Democrat, posed a credible threat to the Democratic frontrunner and galvanized a new progressive movement, which has only been strengthening since. Bernie forced the mainstream Democratic establishment to reluctantly contend with calls to free college, universal health care, and regulations on the big banks due to their growing grassroots following. In 2016, the Republican Party can consider to have had a significant realignment, both as the result of long-term trends and, of course, the Trump factor. Whether these seeds of disruption are headed towards party restructuring, like what happened during the Southern Switch, or outright dissolving to make way for a successor party, like what happened to the Federalists and the Whigs, is yet to be seen. As for the Democratic Party, the path is different, but the destination seems similar. Internal contradictions indicate lack of long-term viability for status quo preservation. The party has settled into two distinct camps, the quote moderate and quote progressive wings, as they call themselves, or the corporate and radical wings, as they call each other, respectively. In the case of the Democrats, it's, it's clearer that the likelihood is much higher for party destruction. Disillusionment with the progressive wing of the Democratic Party grew in 2016 when Sanders supporters felt muscled out by the party machine by a superdelegate tipping of primary elections that many considered outright rigging. Progressives bided the years under Trump's administration. Hindsight, they said, is 2020. The Bernie campaign would come roaring back from the grassroots with rally crowds and volunteer door knockers and phone bankers far outnumbering his opponents, spurred by the influence of the newly arrived Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, a new generation of Berniecrat that would come to epitomize the millennial progressive wing of the increasingly fracturing Democratic Party. Biden, a generally uninspiring ultra-insider, was coronated by the party. When the 2020 primary saw a Sanders surge in early voting states with an increasing likely prospect of the Biden campaign collapsing, opposing candidates under the mainstream Democratic banner simultaneously dropped out to throw their support behind Biden just before Super Tuesday in order to stop Sanders. Former rivals Pete Buttigieg, Amy Klobuchar, and Beto O'Rourke seeking to boost Biden and prevent Bernie Sanders from winning the nomination. Then. The coronavirus caused a worldwide, historic, earth-shattering social and economic upheaval. And then Bernie dropped out and endorsed Biden. While elements of the mainstream-minded Democrats pronounce blue no matter who and pledge to support whoever the candidate is because they are, quote, better than Trump, the progressive wing of the party has now reached a fever pitch of impatience. Democratic establishment and its media allies, faced with their imminent demise, were able to throw everything behind their candidate of choice. Joe Biden is an empty vessel into which they can pour all of their corporatist aspirations. All the pigs that feast at the government trough will continue to be fed. All the same banksters will run the show. As friend of the show, Emma Vigelin tweeted, under a Biden presidency, in the unlikely event that he's able to defeat Trump, there will be no Medicare for all, no Green New Deal, no tuition-free college, no student loan forgiveness, no legal marijuana, no wealth tax, no end of the wars, no trade reform. Joe can say what he wants, and party leaders in the media can line up behind whoever they want. But you're not, not going to tell me or anyone else that we now have to vote for that person. Voters don't owe you anything. You're not entitled to their vote. It's not the way this thing works. You have to actually earn it. It's so clear now that the whole vote blue no matter who line is a total con job. With what progressives feel is a back-to-back -back betrayal of their movement, there is significant disillusionment and an echo of 2016's Bernie or bust sentiment, a hashtag never Biden wing of the Bernie supporters are committed to standing their ground regardless of mainstream Democrats' threats that it will help Trump chances in November. That rationale, they feel, is blackmail. 
So Bernie's role ultimately was not to become president and reign over a democratic socialist administration of the country from the top down, like Roosevelt. His role was more cultural and nuanced, but no less profound. It was to inspire a leftward consciousness shift, galvanize the grassroots movement, and ultimately, in the end, lay the seeds for the destruction of the Democratic Party. Remember, Bernie Sanders is himself not a Democrat. From the beginning of his political career in 1981 until 2015, just before his 2016 candidacy, he was registered independent and only switched to run under the party banner. Yes, he pledged loyalty to the party and endorsed Hillary and Biden after his losses, but he did so as political chess moves to keep his role as a power player on the inside while his legacy winks and nods to the grassroots. Would you run as an independent? No. no. Uh, the answer is no. Uh, and here's why. I am the longest serving independent in the history of the United States Congress. And as I was contemplating what to do, uh, one of the decisions that I had to make, and, and there were a lot of people who said, Bernie, you know, you aren't independent. You've got to run outside of the two-party system. And I thought about it. But I reached the decision, which I think was the proper decision, that for a lot of reasons, the only way at this particular moment in history that we can run an effective campaign was within the Democratic primary and caucus process. And that's what we Make doing. no mistake, this was an infiltration. And that's why party insiders fought to the hilt to keep him out. 2020, or maybe 2024, will join the ranks of 1796, 1824, 1860, 1896, and 1932 years where a decisive election caused an irreversible party realignment and the birth of a new party system. Bernie's role echoes the role of the left during the progressive era, a force that didn't quite take power at the top, but which nonetheless sparked a grassroots cultural shift that made progressive policies comprehended, sought after, and eventually achieved. The rise of the progressives led to a shift from the third to the fourth party systems. The Great Depression led to the rise of the fifth party system. The transition from the more amorphous sixth party system to the upcoming seventh party system has not only the rise of progressivism fracturing the Democratic Party, but an unfolding economic crisis, Trump's realignment of the Republican Party, and a cultural divide centrifugally widening by radicalizing social media bubbles. It's the perfect storm. There's been a long-brewing disillusionment with the duopoly that is now coming to fever pitch. Over a decade, Independent has been the fastest growing party affiliation. While the Democratic Party riding the coattails of its New Deal legacy is assumed to be the, quote, party of the working class, the six-party system has seen the Democratic Party as sympathetic towards Wall Street as its supposed rival is. While many working class voters flocked to Trump, a plutocrat member of the elite, in an ironic protest against the elite. There is no longer a party based on class interests, merely liberal and conservative culture and lifestyle. Class, except for within the emerging progressive wing, has been left out of it. And that means the center will not be able to hold for long. I, the problem is we have one party rule. And that's what people don't realize. As Nancy Pelosi was ripping up Donald Trump's speech at the State of the Union, she was passing his legislative agenda in full. Do you understand the capitulation of the Democratic Party? It's actually not a capitulation, Richard. They're actually on the same team. Donald Trump and Nancy Pelosi work for the same guy. Now, hashtag DemExit is trending. And what began as a hole in the Democratic Dam in 2016 is culminating into a full-on Democratic Party crisis. Well, I just think to save our country, we need to abolish the political parties, make them political action committees. They've been in charge for over 100 years. So how can they say they're not responsible for the horrible state that our country's in today? There's no compromise anymore. Nothing gets done. If Obama wants to do this, the Republicans are opposed to it. If the Republicans want to do something, the Democrats are opposed to it. The best thing we could do is on every ballot, remove all gang names and gang symbols. Here, Jesse Ventura echoes the sentiment of Washington Adams and Hamilton in their aversion to parties, or factions, as they called them. America's two-party system has transformed before, 
and it will transform again. It's degenerated into a duopoly of narrow corporate interests and is already on the inevitable throes of upheaval. Why wait? Many of us have known this for some time, but clung on to a sliver of hope that the party might come to serve our interests. With the epic upheaval of the coronavirus, the massively organized and inspired grassroots, and the 100% loss of hope that many progressive have begun to have for the Democratic Party, the iron is as hot as it's going to be. What will America's next party system look like? There are a few options. One, either one or both of the current mainstream parties collapses and is then replaced by an entirely new party, the way the Whigs or the Republicans were first formed. Two, a third party gains unprecedented traction, causing a major upset by winning the first third party ticket in presidential history, pulling off what Theodore Roosevelt couldn't. Three, the Democrat and Republican names stick, but policy, demographics, or values shift significantly, like what's happened since the 1860s. Four, America shifts to a parliamentary system with proportional representation rather than winner takes all, like most European countries have, causing many parties to spring up. Or five, America revolutionizes into a new political paradigm altogether without political parties at all. That a shift in our party system is coming, there is no question. But what do you think is coming next? Let me know in the comments.